Mr. DiPaolo. Must have been a year since you've been to see us. Yes, it has been, Jesse, and you haven't changed a bit. That's what you said last year and the year before, but I always like to hear it. Are you going to write another article about Plymouth, Mr. DiPaolo? Yep, that's why I'm here. I'm going to drive one of the new cars today. Mr. Peter DePaulo to see Mr. Hadley. Oh, all right, I'll tell him. Thank you. Mr. Hadley has been detained, Mr. DePaulo, but one of his assistants will see you, Mr. Barkley. That's okay, I'll go on up. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hadley's secretary tells me that his plane was grounded in Toledo, so his arrival is indefinite. But the new car will be ready shortly, Mr. DePaulo. That's okay, I'll just walk around. Are you interested in engines, Mr. DiPaolo? Well, yes, uh, I suppose I am. Well, then, you sit over here, and, and I'll tell you all about it. Well, all right, uh, Mr. Barkley, you're very kind. Oh, not at all, not at all. I'm glad to do it. An engineer doesn't often have a chance to talk to a, well, to a layman like this. Now, there's one point that I want to make very clear, just in case you aren't aware of it. Chrysler Corporation engines, from the very beginning, from way back in 1924, have always been recognized for their extremely high efficiency. And when I say recognized, I don't mean just by our engineers. I mean by engineers of other companies and the general public. Now, I don't want to give you much history, Mr. DiPaolo, but I would like to point out just a few of the Chrysler Corporation developments. Things that, well, things that you take for granted today, but they help to explain why Chrysler Corporation engines have always been ahead. For instance, Plymouth was the first car with floating power engine mountings. And that means quieter operation, longer life. We also developed the high compression economy engine. And today, the Plymouth engine has a compression ratio of seven to one with 97 horsepower. Our engineers developed aluminum pistons too. Plymouth uses four rings and the top one is chrome plated for much longer life. Our cars were the first to have oil filters, and today, it's a micronic oil filter that keeps small, gritty particles from getting to the bearings and other engine parts. We were the first to have air cleaners, too, and it has a continual oil bath that guarantees clean air entering the engine. We've got a 45 ampere generator, and with that and the automatic choke, you can always be sure of easy starting and efficient engine operation during warm-up. This year, we've got a six-blade fan cuts down fan noise and increases the rate of cooling. Then take the chain camshaft drive, which is a mechanical feature of great merit lending itself to silence of operation. That's what I mean, Mr. DiPaolo. Chrysler engineering has always been sound. We started out on the right basis, and through the years there's been continuous improvement. Nobody has ever questioned the superiority of Chrysler-designed engines. This is our president, Mr. Mansfield, Mr. DiPaolo, Yes, we've met, Barkley. Hello, Pete. Just heard you were here to see Hadley. Sit down a moment. Yes, Jack. I was at the uh, press showing of the 1953 models, and uh, Newt Hadley said he let me drive one of the new cars this afternoon. So I heard, and that's the most convincing way to find out what we've really got this year. Well, that's what I decided after listening to all the claims they made yesterday. You seem to have exploded an old theory. And I'd like to find out. You'll have your chance, Pete. The car will be ready any minute now. They're installing a transcribing machine so you can dictate notes as you drive. And also an impactograph, which will make a record of the smooth ride even on the roughest roads. Say, you must really believe what you've got this year. You will too, Pete. But what do you think of what you've seen so far? Well, as uh, Mr. Barkley here says, you've always had an outstanding engine. And now you've got a body that I think will be regarded as the most beautiful on the road. If on top of all that, you're right as all you say it is, well, I'd like to find out. 
Well, we can't ask for anything more than that, Pete. Excuse me, Mr. Mansfield. Yes? Mr. DePaulo's car's ready now. Thank you. Well, Pete, it's been awfully nice seeing you. Thanks, Jack. Let me know what you think of that new car now. You bet I will. If you don't mind, Mr. DePaulo, I'd like to ask a favor. Why, sure. My little nephew is just crazy about race drivers, and I wonder if you'd give me your autograph for him. I'd be very happy to. Have you something to write on? I certainly have. He gave me this picture of you. He collects them. Oh, fine. I haven't seen that one for a long time. Thank you very much, Mr. DePaulo. It's all right. Uh, I'm terribly sorry, Mr. DePaulo. I had no idea. Oh, but you do know, Mr. Barkley, and you've done a darn good job. Thanks for all the time you spent. the rear 
seat cushion is divided into three sections, just like in the most expensive cars. Well, the front seat cushion has three pillows, too. They just haven't overlooked anything, have they? Does she always carry on this way about a new car, Ben? The kid thinks she knows a lot about automobiles, all right. She usually wants to redesign every one she looks at. I'm not listening. But tell me, Pete, is it possible that this rear seat's a lot wider than in Dad's car? Or have I just lost weight? It's wider, all right. More than two inches. Really? Sure, and wider front seats with almost three inches more leg room. Well, the car doesn't look that much bigger. It isn't, Ben. They just cut out a lot of waste space, that's all. I'll be darned. Look, Dad, this is kind of nice, too. The glove compartment's in the middle, where anybody in the front seat can get at it. That's all right. You know what? You can see just as well from this rear seat as you can from the front. You don't have that feeling of being all closed in. They're calling that control tower visibility. The new design provides more than 15% additional glass area. But I'm afraid you overlooked another important change, Phyllis. Well, don't let Dad know. He'll never forget. We'll keep it quiet, then. Let's take the rear seats out of both cars, and I'll show you something. But here's the story. The 1952 rear seat tapers off towards the back. Uh-huh. This means, of course, that the springs are pretty thin in the back of the cushion. But the 1953 rear cushion here, full springs all the way back. It's a full depth cushion, as comfortable at the back as it is in the middle and the front. How in the world do they manage that, Pete? It's uh, the new frame design, Ben. It runs flat much further back. It used to rise gradually towards the rear, so that the back seat had to taper. But now, in the 53s, they have a sharp kick up just ahead of the rear axle, so that gives more space for full depth springs for the back seat. Okay, Ben. You ready, Eddie? Yeah. Well, this is what I want. I want comparative shots of both cars. Now, first, take a shot of the 1952 grill. Then take another shot at the same angle, the 1953 grill. So on, all around, both cars. That'll really show how much the appearance of this car has been improved. Okay? Yeah, that ought to do it, Eddie. Let's make it. Okay, that's the 52 grill. Now let's get the same angle on the 53 grill. I better make some notes. Strong, simple lines. Uncluttered. Center grill bar adds to appearance of car's width. Lines of center bar continued into the fenders. Enamel the same color as the body. So is the lower grill bar. All right, now let's go a little higher on the 52 job. Yeah, yeah, that'll do for the 52. Get the same shot of the 53 car, Eddie. Uh-huh, lines more gently rounded. Hood slopes smoothly into fenders. That adds to the appearance of more width, too. So does the one-piece hood, because there's no center line to break it up. Just the new hood ornament that goes back ooh, about a third of the distance to the windshield. Now move up to the windshield of my car, Eddie. Yeah, that'll catch it. That's what I want, Eddie. Now the same thing for 53. Uh-huh. That's what I thought. This one-piece curved windshield gives you a feeling of more width, too. This isn't just an ordinary curved windshield, Ben. It has a more uniform curvature, which practically eliminates all distortion. And you can get it in the Solex glass, too, to cut down on the heat and the glare. And here is something else. Plymouth was the first to have an electric windshield wiper. As far as I know, it's still the only one. And I'm glad to see they retain the cowl ventilator. Good. I'll make a note of that. Let's get to work on the side, Daddy. All right. That's the way she looked in 52. Now for the 53. It's getting clearer now. 
Here are some reasons why the 53 looks so much longer and lower. The front fender top line runs all the way back, makes the car look longer. And so does that horizontal accent line, because it just continues on where the center grill bar lets off. It looks lower because the belt line's been dropped. How much would you say, Pete? The book says three and a half inches. Ah, thanks. Now let's move on back. Yep, that'll take care of 52. Now for 53. As I said before, the top fender line runs all the way through from front to back. Helps to make the car look longer. And so does that character line that's stamped in the sheet metal. Let's look at trunks now, Eddie. Okay. As you would say, Eddie, that's okay. Let's get 53 the same way. Yep. More reason for the lower, wider appearance. The deck lid is much wider. It slopes so gradually into the fenders that you get the impression of even greater width. And with the appearance of a lot more width, you get the feeling of the car being lower, too. And yeah, the gas cap's been moved from the fender to the back. Easy to fuel the car from either side. Better take a look inside the trunk, too, Ben. Yeah. Take a shot of my trunk, Eddie. Okay. All right, now let's see how it compares with the 53 trunk. See what they've done, Ben? The counterbalance hinges are on the extreme outside edges. They don't interfere with the storage space. No chance to scuff your luggage. That gives you more usable space. And then the floor being lower adds even more space. Yeah? Yeah? How much? 30%, the book says. That's uh, an increased cubicle content of more than six bushels. And the spare tire slanted outward to give the deck lid a low profile. Yeah, yeah. Now, move in on my car, Eddie, and get the rear window. Uh-huh. That'll give us an idea of the 52 job. So let's get the new one. Yep, just as I thought. That new, wider rear window does help to make the whole car look wider, and lower, too. One piece curved glass, wrap around at each end. Now let's get comparative shots of the complete car. Deceptive, isn't it? Well, it has uh, more headroom in the front, and the same as 52 in the rear. The front seat is as wide as last year's, but the rear seat is even wider. They retained the uh, chair height seats, but added more leg room to the front. All right, all right, but how about the overall dimension? It says here it's three quarters of an inch lower, half inch narrower, and four and three quarters of an inch less overhang. Well, how can that be? It looks bigger, but it isn't. That doesn't make sense, Pete. It's all in the new design, Ben. They've cut out all the waste space to make more room for the passengers and the luggage. You get it? The new slope of the hood makes for better visibility for the driver, too. Easier handling. That's right. And without the fender bulge, make the rear seat wider. Get it now, Ben? Well, I get everything except one. With this shorter wheelbase, how can I get a smoother ride? We've always been told that it's... That's what I'd like to know, too, Ben. But they say it's a matter of the entirely new type of suspension. Well, they got to prove it to me. Me, too. What do you say, Ben? You put this impactograph in your 52 job and follow me over the same road. Then we'll compare the records and see what's what. Impactograph? What does it do? It records every car, Jolt, on that tape. With one in your car and one in mine, then we can see how they stack up against each other. It's a deal. It's a deal, all right, if I can ride with Pete. Then it is a deal.
And now that I've got a feel of the car, Phyllis, let's really give it a road test. We're now coming into a rather rough road. I'll take it at first at 35, and then hit it up to between 60 and 70. comfortable in here, but let's see what the impactograph says. Doesn't say much of anything, just a very small wiggle in the line. This must be due in part to the new, softer rear springs. They're wider this year, and they're only five leaves instead of seven. This takes up more of the road shock and the springs themselves, with less friction because they're fewer leaves. Wonder how Ben's getting along. Okay. Okay, Ben. This is a test, Eddie. We gotta keep up with Pete. Now we're going into a pretty good curve on a sandy road. I'll take it at about 55. The rear wheels are hugging the road very well. I have a feeling of complete control. This car is very steady on the curve a high degree of stability. This is what Hadley, the chief engineer, told me yesterday. It's because of the new non-parallel control arm arrangement for the front suspension. It resists the outward tilt. That's normal on turns. Normal because of centrifugal action. Some of the stability comes from the new rear springs, too. They allow less twist because they're splayed. That is, they're closer together at the forward end. Look, boys, one finger. We're going to try much the same thing now, only tougher, in a continuous circle on deep sand. Yep, this 53 job hugs the road a lot better, even in sand. It has a shorter turning radius, too. Now, let's check on something else. They told us at the press showing that with their new frame and new body design, they've got an entirely different weight distribution. And the ride we've had so far indicates they've got something all right. Now on this rough stretch, let's check it for pitch. If I know what pitch is, no pitch. If there was, I didn't feel it. What does uh, Impact the Grass say? He says so, too. What do you think? Beginning to think they've got something. Well, nobody asks me, but I'm sure they've got something. Now what? Let's see if we can find a washboard road. A what? You'll see. I'm not surprised at that, not anymore, but watch what happens when I step on the gas on this kind of a road. Do you 
you notice any chatter? Only what's coming from you. I'm talking about rear wheel hop. Do you notice any at all? Uh-uh. Neither did the impactograph. Let's see what happens to Ben's car. Yep, there is a difference this year. Rear wheel hop when accelerating on washboard roads has been greatly reduced by mounting the axle housing forward on the spring. Distance between forward end of spring and rear axle is shortened. All right, Phyllis, let's try one more thing. We are now getting a pretty smooth ride over a very rough road. There are many cars I try this with, particularly at this speed. But this test does indicate a lot less road shock and much less driver fatigue under any condition. This is due to the additional jounce space provided for all wheels. Greater spring travel is possible before the limit bumpers engage. There's much more freedom from bottoming. And even when it does bottom, there's no kick. Happy's taking it easy, and I don't blame him. And now, if you'll hand me that impactograph, Phyllis, we'll take the tape out and make some comparisons. This is our story, Ben, in black and white wheels. Here's where you hit that first rough road, and here's where I went into it. Here's that sandy curve. We took it steady, but your rear wheels must have done some sliding. Shows up the same way on those turns we made in the sand. And here's what happened when we gunned it on the washboard road. I'm satisfied, Ben. Are you? No. I've got to buy a new Plymouth. I'm not satisfied either. And I won't be until you let me drive this car. Well, I used to ride with Ralph De Palma, so... <laughs> All right. Let's give her the works. We shall have music wherever we go.